Let's call it the Pac-9 Conference. Has a good name, right? You are Locked On Trojans, your daily podcast on the USC Trojans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Fight on, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Culkin, and thank you for making Locked On USC your first listen every day. Whether you are watching me on YouTube or wherever you like to download your podcast, we are free. I appreciate your support. You can show your appreciation, and it means a lot. If you're watching on YouTube, become a subscriber. It's easy. It's free. Hit that red subscribe button, and definitely hit that thumbs up button as often as you can, and I don't want you to miss an episode comes at you Monday through Friday, hit that bell notification button. Look, I'm old enough to remember the Pac-8 conference. That's right. It used to be an eight-team conference. Back then, USC, quarterback Vince Evans, you had Ricky Bell, John McKay was the coach, John Robinson took over. There's been a lot of cliches throughout history, talking about history. Well, one of the quotes... Um, and I, the guy's name, I, the guy's name escapes me. I apologize. Ah, Will Durant said this: "History is always repeating itself, but each time the price goes up." On Wednesday, news broke that Colorado is going home. Ralphie and the Colorado Buffaloes—they're going back to the Big Twelve Conference. And because of that. I really think the Pac-12 conference is about to pay the ultimate price. Talk, like I said, it gets expensive. USC and UCLA may have started, I guess, the uh, the stampede now that Ralphie is on the loose. Um, it's caused some pain to the Pac-12. But it's Colorado that essentially, un- look, the Pac-12 was bleeding. And Colorado, with their announcement, essentially untied the tourniquet. And the conference is just about to ble- It's going to bleed out. It's going to be slow. It's going to be painful. But it is what it is. This is, a, this is the cost of what, what, when you get parity and poor leadership. I'm talking about Tom Hansen, Larry Scott after him, the Pac-12 school presidents. This is what happens when you don't back up USC when the sanctions come down, all because of, you know, petty jealousy. USC had been threatening for decades. You better start doing things differently or, you know, we might go explore other avenues. It happened. Took a while, but it happened. And look, poor leadership. I, I Look, it's hard to blame Commissioner George Klyovkov because I don't think he had any idea of this was coming when he took over. But again, on Wednesday, the college football insider, um, Brett McMurphy from the Action Network, he reported that 2023 will be the last season in the Pac-12 for the Colorado Buffaloes. Uh, McMurphy reported that the move will be announced when Colorado officially applies to the Big 12 membership on Thursday. You're watching this episode today of Locked on USC. Thursday is today. Uh, This will have a quick turnaround to as the Big 12 Board of Directors is expected to approve CU's move to the Big 12, and they will start playing in 2024. Colorado is making the same move for the same reason USC jumped to the Big Conference. Colorado is expected to make at least $31.7 million annually in media rights revenue and an estimated $42 million in Big 12 revenue share for a total of $73.7 million per year. In the Pac-12, Colorado has been earning approximately $57.8 million annually, 20.8 of that coming from the media rights deal, the other $37 million coming from the conference revenue share. So, significant difference. Once that Colorado news broke, uh, news just started coming out of everywhere. Max Olson, who writes for The Athletic, he spoke with the Arizona president, Robert C. Robbins, um, and he asked him specifically about the Colorado news. 
<clears throat> President Robbins had this response, quote, all I keep saying is, you know, we're just waiting to get a deal. And then everybody has to evaluate the deal on its merits. I've been pretty steadfast in that stance, end quote. Let me, let me add a footnote to that. By the way, in case anybody wasn't aware of this, did you know that the Arizona school president met and sat down and hung out with Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark, Yormark uh, during the Final Four this past year? Let me put it this way. University of Arizona is as good as gone. It doesn't matter when they announce it. And now that the House of Cards, the Pac-12 House of Cards is about to fall, the question is really, who is next? Is it going to be Arizona? Is it going to be Utah? Could it be a surprise team like Oregon State? Saw that floating around the interweb. Here's how I see it all playing out. I'm just, I'm throwing this on the wall. Bunch of, see what sticks. You tell me. Agree or disagree? Cal and Stanford, they're going to get the call to go to the big conference. Uh, those two institutions meet the AAU academic criteria that certain school presidents um, like to uh, hold on to. Cal needs the cash. They'd probably be willing to go for um, not even be a, a full a full cash member. They'll take 10% less what everybody else is getting. Um, and, and neither school, Cal or Stanford, is really a threat to the football power structure of the big conference. So no threat there. Uh, another positive, it's going to help USC with their travel. It's going to be one less uh, cross-country trip every year. The weekender, the tradition stays alive. It's going to rotate every year. Berkeley one year, Palo Alto the next year. L.A., vice versa. You understand how that works. And then I'm going to go ahead and go Utah. The, both Arizona schools are going to go with Colorado and Oregon State and Washington State to the Big 12. That leaves Oregon and Washington. I feel bad for Washington. They're kind of like, man, what did we do to deserve this? Well, you're up there in the Pacific Northwest. And those two schools are going to end up going to the ACC. Eventually, things are going to get reshuffled again. We're going super conferences here. So we'll see what happens when they, those deck chairs get rearranged. There is a small part of my heart that's going to be sad. But uh, I think I'm going to get over it pretty fast. Lincoln Riley last year came up with uh, a mantra for the team. The longer it goes, the better we get. And it, the context behind that was the longer we work, the harder we work, the better we get. Uh, I think Commissioner Klyovkov tried his own version of that at Pac-12 Media Day. <laughs> yeah, um, that's not aging too well. He, he, he essentially paraphrased, he said, the longer it takes for uh, the Pac-12 to get a, a, their media deal taken care of, more op they have more options. They'll be better off in the long run. That's not working out too well. You also, all you everyday listeners and viewers of Locked on USC, if you remember last week when I mentioned the day before Pac-12 Media Day that there was some smoke swirling with Colorado, I brought up uh, what their chancellor, uh, Phil DiStefano, said. He was quoted. Those words, when they were released at that time, that was intentional. I understand. I know the coach primetime, Deion Sanders, he had to have some medical issues that needed attention. Um, but again, he wasn't there either. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I, I, I purposely think Colorado made sure that they were not going to get asked this question. By sending the defensive coordinator and a couple of players, they, uh, they pretty much uh, cut that subject off at the pass. And George Klyovkov didn't want to talk about anything but football at Pac-12 Media Day. So uh, at least everyone talked about football that day. Right, Commissioner? How do you feel today? I can't imagine you saw this one coming. 
maybe you did and you were just hoping that that day wasn't going to arrive. Well, that day arrived at the end of the Pac-12 conference. So we're going to see who George Klyovkov is linked in with because these days every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business and you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and they're going to do it for free. As easy it is to use LinkedIn to find a job, we've all been there before. It's also just as easy to create a free job on LinkedIn Jobs. You should give it a shot. Once you're there, you're going to add your job listing, and then you add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile, and that way you're going to spread the word that you are hiring. LinkedIn provides you simple tools like screening questions, and that's going to make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and just the right experiences so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to hire and, most importantly, interview for that hire. Recruiting the right person for your team means a better product. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified camps you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com forward slash locked on college. That is LinkedIn college. Terms and conditions will apply. So, Caleb Williams, going into his junior year, he already has a Heisman. He's thrown out the first pitch at the Washington Nationals baseball game. He's done it at the L.A. Dodgers hometown now. He's got his own bobblehead. He's walked the catwalk for a Hugo Boss um, collection. Yeah, he's a model during the offseason. He's started a race in Monaco. He's won an ESPY award. Uh, oh, and by the way, when he's not doing all of that or practicing with his team, he also runs his own Caleb Cares Foundation. Caleb Williams is kind of good. And the crowd who's listening and watching is saying, what else is Captain Obvious going to tell us? Well, this is what Captain Obvious is about to tell you. Uh, especially if you watch this or listen to the show every day. Um, Caleb Williams has been compared to NFL quarterbacks Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. We ha I had a whole segment on that one, one episode, and I came to the conclusion that he is more Josh Allen than Patrick Mahomes. Because as one NFL insider put it to me, uh, Patrick Mahomes doesn't run with an aggressive attitude. He runs because he's looking to escape. Caleb Williams and Josh Allen have a an aggressive attitude, attitude towards taking off and running with the ball. But that was what we talked about back then. What I'm talking about now is Caleb Williams, um, he needs to be more consistent. So, and I'm going to explain. I'm getting, trust me. Uh, we know that he's going to be the number one overall draft pick. And that's despite what Jordan Rodgers thinks, the uh, Vanderbilt quarterback who likes Joe Milton at Tennessee more. Yeah, I was always under the impression that smart people went to Vanderbilt. I'm kidding. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Uh, but like I, said, I, I think someone told me that Superman needs to be more consistent. And this season is going to be, you know, like I said, Caleb is going to be the number one overall draft pick. I will be downright shocked if he's not. And because of that, everyone's going to be coming out of the woodwork and, and start not trying to tear down Superman, Caleb Williams, but they're looking for his flaws, where he can improve. And Kale will be the first one to tell you where he, you know, he needs to make improvements. Uh, once you start believing that you don't need to, game over. You've lost. You have to get better every single day. And it, 
to kind of give you an example how people are going to start, you know, tearing him down or, or, or looking for ways to how, to how things would have been done differently. Caleb Williams was asked about painting his fingernails at Pac-12 Media Day. So, you know, and Caleb said, yeah, you know, probably not, he probably wouldn't do that again. So you learn, you learn by, you learn by making mistakes. My criticism, if you want to call it that, isn't about his leadership qualities. Nowhere close. Caleb is a natural born leader. I, I went over some of that stuff. He's got the Caleb Cares Foundation, um, and his teammates will back that up. I mean, they will go to war for the, for the guy. Uh, Mason Cobb, one of the newest guys to come to the team. He was the latest to confirm. Eric McKinney, um, who I work with over there at WeRSC.com, he asked uh, Caleb, excuse me, he asked Mason Cobb about Caleb Williams at Pac-12 Media Day. Quote, it's so crazy to think that a guy was a true sophomore last season. The way he carried that team, addressing the team. When he talks, it's quiet. Everyone respects him. That's hard to do being 19, 20 years old. Mason Cobb continued. He's a great kid. <laughs> being a Heisman winner, I didn't think he was going to be as humble and outgoing as he is. He's always asking people, hey, how are you doing? And he, showing that he really cares. That's one thing that was surprising to me. I just expected him to be one of those guys who just kind of keeps to themselves. Nah, man. He loves having the guys over, hanging out with the team, end quote. That's why I'm not going to bring up any of that. When Caleb Williams first arrived at USC, that was in the back of my mind. I talked about it. You know, how was he going to make that transition from Oklahoma being the guy? Is it going to affect any type of locker room chemistry? I'm going to going to talk about more about locker room chemistry in the next segment, but before we get there, um, what I'm referring to is during practice, being consistent off the field when no one's looking. So actually on the field too. Uh, he needs to be Joe Burrow's consistent. In other words, if you make a throw 10 times, it has you have to have nine dimes. Ten out of ten would be great, but no one's perfect. But nine of the throws have to be perfect. Right now, if Caleb Williams makes ten throws, he's probably throwing six dimes. They're, they're, he's not throwing the ball out of bounds or where the receiver can't catch it. But when Joe Burrows is going through his routine, it's it's almost robotic. And at the next level, that's what the NFL is all about. It's about consistency. Joe is literally, Joe Burrows is revered for his, you know, off the field dedication, practice dedication. When I say off the field, off when it's not the game. So you can, you know, be a pa uh, Patrick Mahomes or a Josh Allen type of quarterback during the game. Uh, but when it comes to practice, you almost have to be robotic. The footwork, the arm, you know, your arm drills, they have to be the same every single time. Um, you know, improvising on the field, that happens during the moment. You don't want to, you don't want to constrain a Caleb Williams or a, a Mahomes or a Josh Allen. You, that's just a natural you feel, a natural feel you have when you're playing during the game. But during workouts, when it's just you and the receiver, or you're out there with your team, you want to make sure consistency. You're doing every single thing, every time, the same way. And especially if you want to last you know, 10, 15 years in the league, it takes that kind of commitment when the season is over. You make that type of dedication. <coughs> Excuse me. It's it's how the great ones last, you know, forever. You know, the the Tom Brady's, the Aaron Rodgers, the Drew Brees. Um, oh, I heard something the other day too that I'll, I'll bring that up another time. I, it's a new fad that's going on in the NFL, and you'll be shocked uh, what people are doing to focus. Remind me to do that one one episode. Anywho. Um, 
I, Caleb has a better understanding after seeing how certain quarterback QB ones prepare during the off season and listening to their words of wisdom. That's all going to carry over this upcoming fall camp and through all the Trojan practices throughout the season. I'm not going to say that he had a a come to Jesus meeting, if you understand what I'm talking about, but he had a chance to sit down and talk with some guys who knows what it takes to get to the NFL and what it, even more importantly what it takes to last in the NFL. And he heard some words of wisdom and it, it's, it's almost like the, the light bulb went off. And Caleb learned something. He's like, okay, this is the next step, what I need to do. And you heard some of his those answers in his responses at Pac-12 Media Day. So go back, check out those interviews, and you'll understand the context now of what I'm talking about when Caleb is referring to what he needs to do to improve. He did an interview with, uh, with Fox Sports Radio and he, he talked about, you know, he talked about, you know, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, the great ones. And you can hear it when Caleb was talking. He now has that mama, that mamba mentality going into 2023. And he was talking about how, you know, some of his teammates, they might not like him during the season because he's going to hold everybody accountable. You know, he's going to take on that Travis Dye role, tell people, hey, you suck, you're not doing your job. But this is the other part of the equation. If you go 1-0 every week, and you do that 15 times, as Caleb said, you know, we'll be holding up the trophy at the end of the year, and everyone will love everyone again. And that's what it's all about. All right, in this third segment, you're watching this a Thursday. While you're watching this, if you haven't already done, if you're not done watching by now, uh, I'm over there at USC Media Day. USC went through their Pac-12 Media Day last week, last Friday in Las Vegas. It was interesting. We hung out, got out. Um, there were signs that things weren't right last week and look that might in fact that is going to be the more than likely the last pac-12 media day talked about in the first segment house of cards it's fallen well last year um we're doing the same thing we're going to do this year that we did last year we met the coaching staff and a handful of players it was USC local media day. All the local media, uh, internet, LA Times, OC Register, uh, TV, CBS, NBC, ABC, KTTP, Fox, all those guys. Um, you get We had the opportunity to come together for a few hours, meet the assistant coaches, handful of players. We're going to do that again today on Thursday. And these are going to be the three biggest keys that uh, at least I'll be focused on at USC's media day. Number one, first and foremost, Alex Grinch and the defense. Number two, how, how quickly is uh, can the O-line come together? We've been talking about that throughout the summer. They've got the pieces. Number three, team chemistry. So, going back to number one, I'm curious as to how aggressive uh, is the media going to be with Alex Grinch? You know, making him to kind of rehash what happened at the end of the season answer the same questions that were asked and answered after those games. And But I do want to hear from Coach Grinch what's different this year versus last year. He's had some time to reflect. You know, we're one day away from fall camp. Let's see if, if he's got some new answers for us to, to work with. Uh, I want to ask him, you know, are the personnel additions the difference between this year making the playoffs in last year, just narrowly missing it. Uh, how, how much of last year's film is still being used to correct those issues? And then, as far as the defense is concerned, has anything changed philosophically? 
when we were talking to the O-line group, the players and Josh Henson, uh, you know, they have, like I said, they have the right pieces, but where are they going to play? You know, how close will the offensive line resemble what we saw during the spring, which wasn't what everybody anticipated, or will it be closer to what I've been hearing? And you know, if you've been listening or watching any Locked on USC episodes throughout the summer, I've hinted, in fact, I've mentioned some players who you think are going to be on the right side might be on the left side. So I'll let you know. You know, the offensive line group is, it, it's the hardest to see at practice due to proximity. Um, the O-line group is literally the furthest away from the media. So I'll do my best to see how they're lining up. And then I'll let you know in uh, those notes and observation reports. So we'll see. And again, with the offensive line is how soon will those top eight guys be identified? Will there be more than eight guys? Will be there? Will there be less than eight guys that go into the rotation? And then third, uh, team chemistry overall. Look, there was a there were guys who were brought in to, to fill the holes this past uh, that the past recruiting has left on the roster. And those guys that came in with this transfer portal, everyone's anticipating each of those guys to step in and take over, become a starter. So how's that going to play out in the locker room? Are the guys who were recruited by USC before these guys transferred over? Are they going to just, are they going to make it easy for those guys to take their jobs? Or are they going to fight for it? Are they just going to step aside? What's going to happen? The reason I'm bringing that up, there's a lot of pressure this season, um, and that's part of the territory when you play at USC, win championships. But again, last this is the last season with Caleb Williams, most likely, and the playoffs are on the line, and you've got the big conference looming in 2024. Can this team prove it um, to the defensive high school recruits this season before signing day that, uh, hey, you got a chance to reconsider your initial decision and uh, come play for USC? I'll have a roundup of everything that took place at USC's Media Day on the next episode of Locked on USC. While you're watching that, um, I'll be getting up around 4.30 in the morning for my wake-up call because that first USC practice is on Friday morning, 6 a.m. I'll be there covering it for Locked on USC. I'll also be there with WeRSC.com. Folks, we're back. The season is here. Make sure you're watching Locked on USC every day. Part of the Locked on Network. <clears throat> and tell a friend. Let's get this. Hey, help me build my subscriber numbers up. All right. I appreciate everything you guys do. And until that next episode of Locked on USC, everyone, you know what to do.